Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Eric Topol. Well, I'm pleased to be with you, and thanks for picking this as a session to join during the festival. Uh, Mike, is it better now? Okay. Okay, thanks for joining, and I'm very pleased that you selected this as a segment to join during your time here at the festival. Uh, we're going to be talking about the future of medicine, uh, and especially how you can have much more charge of your care uh, because of technology and because uh, I guess I'd start off with how many of you here do not use a smartphone? Okay, one. Okay. Anyway, so that's kind of part of the story here. That's a major hub of the future. And uh, I, I think we're going to build on You're going to be seeing a medicalized uh, smartphone uh, and uh, where that's going to lead us uh, with algorithms and not really ever letting go of the important aspects of human-to-human -human bond of medicine, but also taking advantage of where technology is going. So uh, let me first start with um, a couple of points about where we are. Uh, see if we can get these slides to move forward. Um, not moving. Oh, okay. Now we jump way ahead. Uh, okay. So first I wanted to point out, if you haven't realized it, just uh, a matter of weeks ago, we became officially um, a health economy of the United States. That is, there's more jobs in healthcare than retail, which used to be the number one for many decades, and any other type of uh, sector of our of our economy. So this is a big business, and I don't know how many of you were at Libby Rosenthal's session just before this, but she really got into that and how <coughs> how sad it is uh, that it's such a big business. And uh, the problem we have, though, is that with all that money we're spending, which is 3.5 trillion a year, it's over 18 percent of the GDP. It's over 11,000 per person per year. With all that, we have one of the worst track records of outcomes of any country, any developed country in the world. Life expectancy, childhood mortality, infant mortality, maternal mortality are all ranked number 30 or, or lower. So this is, we're not doing very well here. Uh, and the question is, why is that? Well, one of the reasons is more than any other place in the world, we use lots of procedures and we operate very liberally and a lot of those wind up backfiring with people getting hurt inadvertently. And so, for example, screening, mammography and PSA screening, and I just met a urologist here in the front row, of course, who is going to be an advocate of PSA screening. I couldn't be more of an advocate against PSA screening. At any rate, uh, what happens is uh, people are hurt. And if these were ever drugs, they would never be approved. And the reason is that if you look at mammography in the prototypic women, uh, 10,000 women who are ideally suited for a mammogram, uh, only five people over a 10-year period are benefited, five women. Over 6,000 of the 10,000 are hurt with false positive results, often resulting in biopsies and all sorts of therapies. And it's almost the same for PSA. The net benefit is, it doesn't, isn't there. It's much worse with respect to outcomes on a population basis. It's not just about the uh, issues of screening. It's also everything in medicine in this country where we use so much stuff. Medications. These are the most expensive 10 medications. And the little red people indicate the, the, those who uh, don't respond to those medications. 75% don't respond to the most expensive drugs that are uh, sold today. So back in July, I wrote a big uh, Saturday essay in the Wall Street Journal about how we need to get smarter and all this debate about uh, Obamacare or Trump care, all this stuff, it's meaningless because we need to get the costs reduced because that's what's crippling uh, the economy and each of us as we deal with uh, our health care. So there was a very impressive uh, article published back in the 60s and it was about patient-centered care. I don't know if you, that term is used a lot in the medical circles. It's meaningless today because we don't do patient-centered care. And if we are to do that, we need to understand each unique human being. And that's what this is about. How do we understand each person as a true individual? And so it turns out today that more than oil or gold, data is the most valuable resource. And above all data is medical data. 
And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but your medical data has likely been hacked. At some point or other, more than a third of Americans have been hacked. And that data is worth more than fivefold your personal data, like your credit information and all that sort of thing. It's very valuable data. And it's not being handled right uh, in this country, unfortunately. So we're going to talk about the three Ds. First is digitization, uh, then democratization, because when data are portable about your health, then of course it becomes uh, the ability to democratize uh, this whole affair. And then this last phase, which is uh, the subject of a, a book I've just completed. It will be a while before it's out there, but it's about artificial intelligence and deep learning. So the essence about understanding each human being is all these different layers. So you're familiar with a Google map with the street view and the satellite view and the traffic view and all these things. Well, this is the same for human beings. All these different layers of us, whether it's our DNA sequence, our proteins and metabolites, our microbiome, our physiology through sensors, uh, our external features, and uh, of course that also extends to our, our um, environment. And that can be quantified through sensors as well. So it turns out that to, to understand a human being, you can't just do these things once. Many of them you need to track throughout one's life. And in, uh, in, the, wor in the world of genomics, which I work in quite a bit, that is uh, uh, something you can track before birth all the way through uh, one's health span, lifespan. And I had written a big review article called it uh, From Pre-Womb to Tomb. And one of my old uh, mentors told me, Eric, you blew it. You should have called it From Lust to Dust. Um, <laughs> Um, but I, I just want to touch on this briefly. We're not going to spend a lot of time in genomics. Um, I, I would be interested, how many of you have had things like 23andMe or Ancestry.com? Uh, yeah, quite a few, interesting. It's, it was the number one, one of the number top uh, gifts over the holiday season last year. Um, and that data is relatively limited as to what you can actually get uh, today and in the future. But basically now we can sequence sick newborns and save lives through sequencing within 24 hours to get their results. We can, children, a lot of different types of problems in children can be diagnosed rapidly through sequencing. Uh, many also in young adults. What's really interesting is when you have an infection, the way it has been treated all over the years is to give lots of different antibiotics, so-called broad spectrum, and wait for two or three days before the cultures come back. Now we can sequence the bug and within hours know exactly what antibiotic to give rather than a lot of possibly toxic uh, drugs. Uh, cancer is a genomic disease. We'll talk about that for in a bit. And also sudden death occurs frequently even in young people and autopsy is frequently unhelpful. And we can sequence the deceased and the family members so we can alleviate their lifelong concerns about whether they're going to have uh, a sudden death uh, event. So I mentioned cancer because this is about the DNA getting off the tracks. And uh, this is, a of course, now soon to become the number one disease killer of man. It all along has been heart disease. Uh, what's really exciting in cancer is that now the tumor DNA is in the bloodstream. It's in the plasma and someone has cancer. And it can be picked up. And this is going to lead eventually to the earliest possible diagnosis of cancer. So someday in the future, not quite, this study just came out last week, and it, it looked at eight different types of cancer. And uh, when it found some tumor DNA in the blood or se several different proteins, it picked up, it would have picked up cancer against, com uh, this is compared to healthy controls, with 99% more than 99% specificity, meaning no, essentially almost no false positives. So this is the future rather than someone developing uh, uh, symptoms or, or a mass. Uh, uh, this is going to be where we head uh, with cancer. And, and indeed, we can manage people uh, with cancer uh, this way. Uh, that is, instead of doing actual biopsies of an organ, this can just be gleaned from a single tube of blood. So the, and by the way, interrupt any time, any questions. If we don't get through what I had prepared, um, that's fine with me. I just want to answer your questions and make sure that your, your curiosity is not left uh, without uh, any type of uh, response. Um, one of the biggest areas of medicine today, perhaps would be considered the most exciting, is gene therapy and genome editing. 
We've never been able to do this before, that is, to cure disease in man. And um, this is um, something that I've been thinking about for 40-some years, but it's really exciting that it, now there's FDA gene therapy approved for a rare eye disease to restore vision. And there's many different diseases like sickle cell and hemophilia and thalassemia uh, and lots of different rare diseases that are on the way to clinical trials this year. Some of them have already started in China. And these will undoubtedly result in pretty substantial new treatments, e even potentially cures. So this is really a very unique time in the whole uh, world of medicine. But now I want to get to what is more of the smartphone story, and that is sensors. You can track any part of your body with a sensor. Most of them are wearable sensors. And uh, so, of course, some of them you carry around with you. And I want to just give you a couple of examples. So um, a cardiogram, you probably have seen the fact that you can do a cardiogram on your phone um, very readily. Um, anybody want to do their cardiogram? There you go. Just put your thumbs on that, like that, and uh, we'll do your cardiogram. Um, so anybody who has a history of heart rhythm problems or they might have, they had fainting, uh, their heart is irregular, uh, can do can get this. It's very simple. We'll record this, and uh, you don't have to press tight. We'll get there in a sec. Uh, here we go. Just loose tight. There we go. Okay, so I'll show it to you in just a sec. We can get so that's perfectly normal sinus rhythm. Uh, anyone? I think you can get it off of Amazon. Yeah. And we'll get a complete recording. And uh, your heart rhythm is perfectly normal, which is great. Uh, well, I've had that happen, <laughs> yes. OK. So what this shows, um, OK. What this shows is a heart rate of 76. But more importantly is what is the rhythm, OK? And uh, what's really nice about this now, so you have this. This is just a little thing you can keep in your purse or your pocket. And you can do your cardiogram if you had some symptoms. But now it's gone to another level because now it's in on top of the Apple Watch. So if you have an Apple Watch, you have to get a new band for the Apple Watch through the same company that makes this, this little gadget, a live core. And then it monitors wherever you're wearing the watch. It has deep learning, artificial intelligence about how your heart rate responds to your activity. And then it will tell you whether or not you should put your thumb on the watch band to record the rhythm, just like you did. OK, and so then if you have atrial fibrillation, you diagnose it yourself. And by the way, if I wasn't here, you would just press interpret, and an algorithm would tell you what is your heart rhythm. So you don't have to go to the emergency room. You don't have to go to, um, to urgent care. And a lot of times, a lot of, a lot of patients who I look after they're worried about their heart rhythm. They feel a lot of irregularity, and they feel great reassurance to know it's actually just normal, just some extra beats. The band? Yeah, you can order it through. Uh, it's called the Cardia Band, but the company is called Alive Core, and it's um, it's yeah, you can get that through Amazon. K. And I have no association with these companies, so you don't. I'm not. I don't get any royalties from Cardia Band, just so you know. Okay. Um, so I think this is, by the way, this is the first artificial intelligence in medicine approved by the FDA November 30th. Um, it's a historical little thing, just so you know. There'll be a lot more coming. Uh, this is about deep learning, so it's a different heart, a, a different trigger to tell you to get your cardiogram um, than for, you know, for each person. But it isn't perfect. It tells me to, it gives you the haptic, if you have that Apple Watch, you know that little pressure will give you a haptic signal. And sometimes it's done that for me, and it, my heart rhythm is normal. So it isn't perfect, but it's good. Now, um, those of you who are diabetic or are concerned about getting diabetes, you can also get your glucose through your watch or your phone. Uh, and these are now getting less and less expensive. Um, and there's uh, many different companies that are competing, so it's good. And uh, this is nice because you can just glance at your watch, you get your glucose, it will change what you eat. Because what you learn quickly are certain foods 
that get you out of whack, and everyone has a unique response to foods, as we'll get into. This is a great watch by a company called Omron, uh, which is a blood pressure watch. So this watch, uh, which is uh, really interesting because you just press start, so it isn't doing your blood pressure all the time. You have to tell start, and then you get your blood pressure in a matter of seconds. Now, why is that interesting? Well, typically when you're having a heated discussion with your spouse <laughs> or you're in traffic or something is not just right, you don't really have a way to measure your blood pressure. Now you do. So this is going to be really interesting, and then it's soon to be cycling throughout the night so you could actually get blood pressures throughout the night. And that's actually very important because, by the way, <laughs> the number one chronic disease of man, hypertension. And most people, the majority of people with hypertension, don't have very good blood co pressure control. And so we're trying to avoid the strokes and heart attacks and the other things that happen with uncontrolled blood pressure. And part of it is we don't measure it enough. We don't even know what normal is yet. Okay, uh, I already showed that. Okay, going forward. This is actually a device that I love. It's a smartphone ultrasound. And it isn't ready for you yet because you don't know how to um, interpret and acquire ultrasound, but probably over time you will through uh, artificial intelligence. But what this is is a device, a, a probe, that connects to the smartphone. And so it looks like this. It goes to an Android phone. And this probe you can put anywhere in the body except the brain. You can't image through the skull. But anywhere else you can image. And you get exquisite imaging as good as the $350,000 machine that sits in the hospital lab through your smartphone. So I really love this because I, every patient I see, um, this, is, this is an example of the heart. Uh, I'm a cardiologist. So when I see a patient, I don't ever listen to their heart sound. Why would I listen to Lub Dub when I can see everything immediately? So here on this video, you see the heart valves, you see the heart muscle, how thick it is, the size of the chambers, all within seconds. And I then review it with the patient so they can see it. They could never know what the Lub Dub was about because they couldn't hear it. And even if they could, they didn't know, even the doctors don't know what it means. But everyone can see it now. And seeing is believing, yes. That's right. And this is representative. I mean, every single patient uh, that, that I see, this is what has replaced the stethoscope, which is almost 210 years old, and it needs to be pushed aside, even though it's the icon of medicine. Because you can do this. Now, that you can also get the blood flow. So you can see leak of valves, and you can show it to the p patient who has a leaky valve to see how much uh, leak there is. And this is exquisite. Uh, this is technology that enhances the intimacy of a visit to the, to the doctor. It should be used by every doctor when, during a visit for the appropriate uh, um, uh, you know, uh, subject. How widespread is this? It should be used by all doctors. I would say it's less than 1%, maybe 0.1%. And the excuse for it is, guess what? Anyone want to guess? No reimbursement. No reimbursement. And that's right. But your stethoscope, you don't get reimbursement. This is the modern stethoscope. Um, so I really went to town on this device. When I first got it, I said, I'm going to just image my entire body. Yeah. So I did. I did a medical <laughs> selfie. You know, that's a total <laughs> selfie. So I did the carotids, the sinuses, uh, my thyroid gland, uh, my lungs. Gee, it's great for the lungs, the heart. I showed you all the way liver, gallbladder, uh, kidney, uh, iliac artery, spleen, uh, aorta, all this stuff. I went all the way, all the way down uh, to the, my left foot. So that's what's amazing is you can do all this imaging through your phone. Now, I'm going to give you an example of this is such uh, exquisite imaging. That your point about quality is amazing how good this is. And there's five different types of this smartphone, and it's good. They're competing, and hopefully the price will keep coming down. They cost uh, $199 a month for all the doctors in the clinic. They share it, so you know you can get. You can buy it personally, and somewhere anywhere between the, the different models, two thousand all the way up to seven thousand. If you buy it, okay. Now, recently, actually Easter Sunday, I had discomfort in my uh, abdomen, and it, I I also felt it in my back, and I didn't know what it was, so I imaged my kidney, 
which I already learned from doing the total body selfie. And I had a dilated kidney. So I went to the emergency room with my dilated kidney. And uh, first of all, the doctor in the emergency room said, you have a dilated kidney on your smartphone? <laughs> you know, like I was some kind of alien that just landed. You know? um, so of course, the reflex was, that would have made the diagnosis, right? The reflex, oh, we got to send you for a t CT scan. That's the United States, only in the United States, you know, tenfold more scans in this country than any other place in the world. So I went for the CT scan that cost $2,500. That was a discounted rate for me as the doctor in the health system. Um, and sure enough, it was superimposable images from my smartphone. Um, and then I had my, fortunately, my kidney stones were passed. And um, anyway, so that just shows you how your smartphone can diagnose things like that, which are uh, unfortunately quite, quite common. So I want to leave you with the sense that the smartphone is getting medicalized. You can talk to a doctor immediately through a telemedicine visit today. Uh, all these different things are ultrasound, any body part. Soon enough, you'll be able to do that yourself. It's not hard to acquire the images. You just need an algorithm to interpret it and many, many other things. So this is a very, uh, uh, I think, uh, extraordinary time of using this device that everybody except one person here has to, <laughs> for medical and health purposes. Okay. Now, once you have all this data that's free-flowing, then you have this democratization where, where doctors and patients are on the same level playing field. Instead of the medical paternalism, which has been going on for more than two millennia, it started with Hippocrates. So we now uh, can say that patients have a different attitude because you're now used to doing everything through a smartphone, you know, whether it's hiring a car, or whether it's getting a task rabbit, whatever you do with your smartphone, why can't you do that in the medical sphere? So we have a different attitude. And this captures it. Miss Kelly, the doctor will see you now. Uh, can you let the doctor know that I'll be with him shortly? <laughs> I, I'm getting a lot of work done. Your Wi-Fi is very fast. But he's ready for you now. I'll be with him as soon as I can. You ready? Not yet, but you're next. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The new attitude. Okay, let me ask you this. What is the average time it takes to get a primary care doctor appointment in the United States throughout the country? Primary care doctor appointment, just to get the appointment. 35 weeks. Okay, three, over three weeks, 3.1 weeks. In, in uh, Boston, it's almost eight weeks. All right. Now, when you get that appointment, that precious appointment that you waited all that time, how, is the, how much is the average time you sit in the waiting room for that appointment? 61 minutes. Okay? So, you know what? Your time is valuable. And why should you get dissed like that? That has to stop. And that's why a lot of people are turning to telemedicine because they can just hit the app and they start talking to a doctor immediately. So that's, in fact, you can even summon a doctor to your house in many places. Uh, one of the big ones in this part of the country in Southern California is called Heal. And it was uh, the main backer of it, of all people, is Lionel Richie, Heal. And you hit the app and the doctor comes to your house and it's covered by your insurance. So I asked Lionel, why didn't you call it all night long? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, doc, it's all day long, too. So, okay. Um, now, your medical data, um, that's what has to get fixed here. And uh, I don't know many of you are on Twitter, but um, I use Twitter as a way to get ideas out there. And I posted this with the 27 points about your data. It should be your data, and you should own it because you paid for it, it's your body, you have the most interest in your data. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Your data is being sold all the time, you don't know it. It has full of mistakes in your chart that you've never had a chance to edit and correct. And it could save your life. 
because we, if you owned it and you had it when you were traveling or who knows where you are, it could actually prove to be critical uh, in terms of your management. So we need to get pe people to have the rightful owner of your data, but we're still a ways uh, from that, and that's really unfortunate. And we can't go forward like this because we had in the last year over 100 million adults in this country having their data hacked. Uh, and uh, this is cyber thievery and hacking is going on rampant in a way uh, because it's such a valuable uh, commodity. Uh, so we've written a lot about this in the New York Times and many other uh, places about how we have to stop this and we need to get a movement so that people own their data, whether it be in a private cloud or a blockchain. As you can imagine, the more the data is aggregated about people, the more of a target it is because it is so valuable. So that's why you have to get it at units of one or families rather than units of millions of people. The more it's sitting in a big servers, server farms, the more it's a target. So we are running a program called All of Us. You probably haven't heard of it yet, but back in 2015, uh, then President Obama announced the Precision Medicine Initiative of a million Americans. And the million Americans are volunteering to be participants in a study that's going on for decades. They will get sensors. About 12,000 people have been enrolled of the million, so we're still at the early stage. May 6th is the official national launch in many cities throughout the country. If you want to participate, you certainly can. You'll have genomes sequenced and sensors and all sorts of things because you're participating in this massive, ambitious, very far-reaching program to individualize medicine in the future. So this Precision Medicine Initiative, Scripps Research, where I work, is the main participant center. M Mayo Clinic is where the biobank exists, and then Vanderbilt is where the data analytics center is. Um, so we work with lots of partners. So for example, you'll be able to go into a Walgreens clinic and get enrolled there. Uh, you'll be hearing about it from all sorts of, for example, if you have Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance, you'll be hearing it through them. We have lots of different partners help us get the word out because this is such a, 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 a unusually um, uh, ambitious and exciting research program. There's nothing ever been like it in history. Had any of you heard of this before today? Yeah, the, the word isn't out yet, but you will, it's only uh, January, but come May, you'll be hearing a lot about it. You won't be able to go anywhere without hearing about all of us. The government, everything you get for free, uh, you, it's all through, you enroll through your smartphone or a website. You have to go for one visit only, uh, and that's to get uh, some blood draw and a brief physical exam, and then we, we send you things if you want. So, for example, you want the blood pressure watch, we send that to you. If you want your microbiome done, we, we send you a, 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 a cup for that, you know, and that kind of stuff. Okay. That's your gut microbiome, by the way. Um, okay. Now. Deep learning is the last thing, and then I want to leave it open for questions. Uh, this is the artificial intelligence subtype. This is what's really uh, ex uh, extraordinary um, with medicine going forward. It is about algorithms, so just like the algorithm that you could have used to get your cardiogram interpreted, but that's a dumb algorithm. That's a dumb one because it, it wasn't an autodidactic. That is, every cardiogram that it was interpreting would get better and better and better. and so. That's what deep learning is about. It's about this neural network, a neural network which is supposed to simulate the brain, the human brain. It really doesn't, but it's still called neural networks. Back five years ago, there was this incredible classic paper from uh, the group in Toronto that showed that it could interpret any image almost as good as human, any image. And this is from a big image library from, called ImageNet of now 15 million different images, which had a thousand labels for each image, so really detailed. And then the combination of labeled data like that, the interesting thing is the gaming world, the uh, video games, they have uh, special graphic processor units, and had it not been for these GPUs, we wouldn't have uh, deep learning in medicine. And then uh, the cloud for computing, and then these different open source uh, modules to, to promote uh, the whole deep learning field. So I want to just give you a few quick examples so you'll get a sense of where the field's headed. If you have a child with a possible congenital disease, 
a picture of the face of the child makes the diagnosis with 99% accuracy. And over 60% of medical geneticists in this country are using this app, which is a free app. That's facial recognition, but it's used in medical circles. This is an algorithm, a uh, deep learning algorithm, that it reads cardiograms better than cardiologists. Stanford, uh, recently published. And here's one that is reading better than ophthalmologist diabetic retinopathy, which I think you may know that a lot of people with diabetes, but they don't get their retina screen for this, and it can be prevented losing vision from, from diabetic retinopathy. The most impressive study yet was comparing to 21 board-certified dermatologists at Stanford. And what it showed is it, the machine algorithm could diagnose skin cancer more accurately than the dermatologist. So what you're seeing here is patterns, images, cardiograms, that a algorithm can do superhuman performance. And with that is the ability to fashion things like your diet per individual. So, you know, we've always, we've lived through all these different food pyramids and incorrect recommendations from places like the American Heart Association, which said you got to be on a low-fat diet. And it turns out that was all wrong because everybody's different. And this group in Israel, which they just recently published this book, if you're interested in this, called The Personalized Diet, um, this, uh, they basically found that we could each eat the same food and our glucose response will be entirely unique. And the interesting thing that of all the different things that drives that, it's your gut microbiome, the bacteria in your gut microbiome that changes your glucose regulation. So they looked at 2,000 people, they gave them a very special uh, you know, food that everyone had the same. They had their glucoses assessed every five minutes for two weeks, and then they found out what foods uh, was driving for each person the best diet to keep their glucose in a tight range. And uh, I, there was an editorial called Siri, uh, What Should I Eat uh, with that? Um, and, and you might be saying that sometime, maybe not to Siri, but maybe to Alexa. By the way, how many people here have uh, Alexa at home? Wow, wow, that's incredible. So about how many of you use Twitter here? Okay, that, so Alexa's really big and Twitter's a bomb. That's really interesting. <laughs> okay. How many have multiple uh, Alexa devices in their house? Yeah, yeah, wow. That's amazing. Um, okay, well, it's projected that 80% of people in, in the next couple of years will be using voice uh, assistants. And remember, that's the voice medical assistant. And the problem with Alexa today is it sits in a cylinder in your bedroom or somewhere in your house. And you want that same functionality everywhere you go. And that's what's going to happen. There, that, the, the move on that Alexa point 3.0 is already uh, 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 on the way. But just so you so I did this, this test. I did the glucose every five minutes for two weeks. I, did the, I had to log everything on my smartphone about exercise and uh, everything I drank, my sleep. It was a pain in the neck to do this, I have to say. Um, and I had my gut microbiome sample sent in. And then I got a recommendation for me of every food I should or shouldn't eat. And they all got rated as either A or B, C, D. And it was said that some of my favorite foods are in the D category, you know. But I, I can also, they have thousands of foods now through this algorithm, machine learning algorithm, and I can search and say, you know, what if I eat this? And it will tell me, it will give me a rating for me. Um, so that's something if you're interested in, it's, it, it's still uh, it's a work in progress, but it's really pretty exciting. Now, um, you've been hearing a lot about driverless cars. And it turns out a lot of that is real hype. There's not going to be a car that picks you up uh, in the rain or some other condition uh, that's going to drive you somewhere um, uh, without any human backup. That is, you cannot possibly establish control. That's what's called level five of the Society of Automotive automotive engineers, because that is not possible. And even if you project out many decades from now, level five isn't really uh, going to be attainable. Uh, it will be working in certain conditions, like a beautiful day like this. Yeah, there might be a driverless car, but there also might be human backup, that is, if something happens. But with medicine, we're never going to get to level five. 
we'll be lucky if we ever get to level three. Right now, we're at level zero. But we are going to see more and more machine support, apprentices, partnerships to help doctors. And the last point I want to make, uh, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for questions, um, and that is when you see a doctor at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, they ask, what are the words you thought of the most when you saw the doctor? And this is the word cloud from their study. Okay? They, each person had to give two or three words of what it was like to see their doctor. And I want to say University of Alabama is a southern hospitality place, right? <laughs> it's, not, it's even worse in other parts of the country. And so the point being is if we could change medicine where this artificial intelligence wave actually promotes more of the patient-doctor relationship because it's, been, it's degraded terribly the way it is today, then we could fix medicine. And that's what we need to do because it's really in a kind of desperate uh, shape right now. So I leave you with the sense that we can do this deep phenotyping, that is understanding each human being far better than we could ever in the past. Uh, we can also use this deep learning approach and then we can get hopefully the most important thing of all the things I've mentioned this morning, which is deep learning, I mean deep empathy, uh, not deep learning. That is the ability to restore the human uh, connection between patients and doctors, which is hard to get today. It's hard to get that trust and that true caring that you, the health care has lost the care, uh, and that's what we want to restore. So I have a lot of people that I get to uh, the privilege of working with. Let me acknowledge them, and let me open up to any questions that you have. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for you and then you, right? <laughs> Oh, the book for the diet? Yeah. It's called The Personalized Diet. It's by um, Siegel and Elenov from Israel. Yes. Who else? Uh, right. Yes. Well, where do you live? Here? Uh, it, you will be able to enroll here, but probably in April or May, and you'll get word about that. Oh, you're going to hear it through the web, through your, you know, through your health plans, all sorts of ways. You you won't be able to miss it. It'll be billboards. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And do you, do, do you live here as well? Yeah. So. Yeah, you can get a code, and then that'll get you in. Well, we'd love to have you as part of it, I can assure you. Yes? So I don't have to do a colonoscopy next year? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I'm with you. I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. Uh, that's where we want to go. Yeah, so if you just had one, you're, maybe by the night or your next one's due, we'll be there. It's not, it's not ready, but it's being tested for that. Right? Uh, I think it's going to eventually, we will, we will supersede colonoscopies. The question is, is it going to take five, ten years? You know, it probably within ten we'll, we'll get rid of colon the need for colonoscopies. Um, yeah. Yes? I, I have two things. One is a statement. I, I think part of the lack of caring that's come across is the fear that what the insurance company has made doctors do, sitting at a computer looking at that and answering questions in order to get paid. All right, so let me, let me respond. So I totally agree. So the, the point about it, I'm going to repeat, he's asserting, and appropriately, correctly, that the electronic health record has been the destructive force in medicine because it takes doctors, they don't even look at their patients now, they're just on a keyboard, and it's led to a lot of burnout and depression, that in itself, no less having to deal with administrative and insurers and everything else. So, but the electronic health record is a big culprit. Yeah. To think like this because we were taught to take care of sick patients and now you've changed it to take care of people who you want to keep healthy. It's yeah. a total different. Right. Topic. So the, this is a really important topic and that is medical education of the future. So today we have uh, between MD and DO schools, we have 170 in the United States and we still have the thing called the MCATs which are tests to uh, be able to discern people's 
uh, science, reasoning. Well, guess what? That's not going to be so important in the future. But we don't pick our people with empathy. We don't pick out for people who are good at interpersonal connections, who would then be the ones who would garner trust and have human bonding. We will have machines that will do the information and the reasoning better than most humans, in fact, all humans eventually. So we need to come up with new strategies. By the way, we don't teach any medical school smartphone ultrasound, only, only two in the country. We don't teach them genomics, that is, getting themselves sequenced. Uh, we're still having cadavers, which we could do through 3D simulation. I mean, the medical school is archaic. The problem with it is that it's run by old doctors who are resistant to change. And so we need the young docs to take over. It's going to take a while before the 20,000 plus medical students that enter each year are getting the right kind of education for the future. Yes. Yeah. So the opioid epidemic is a multi-fold perfect storm, if you will. In part, it's the, the, the manufacturers like Purdue Pharmaceuticals and others. In part, it's that doctors didn't want to bother with the patients, so they just wrote prescriptions ad lib, uh, willy-nilly way. Um, it's, it's obviously a very serious, and it's accounted for now in the U.S. a decrement of longevity. Young people are dying from opioid uh, addiction now in their 30s and 40s. And so it's very serious. There's no solution in sight. One thing that's happening right now is doctors are being more restrictive about uh, giving uh, opiates. Perhaps the greatest hope of all going forward is that we can use medications that achieve pain relief that are not opiates, that are not addictive. And there are some of those that exist today. They hadn't been used, but there are also many in development. But uh, it's, it's a national um, uh, epidemic that is a, it's a true uh, fiasco. And uh, I hope that you know it will start to we'll start to see some uh, turnaround which we haven't seen yet. Very serious problem. Yes. So we can get these maps, these various Markman maps to measure the health. Um, is the information you're sending in particular the smartphone, or is it being uploaded to something? And if so, what's the difference? Yeah. So the great question: What happens to that data of yours that's going through the smartphone app? And so each the, each of them are different. And so you, now, probably no one here reads that when they say, I agree. And it takes a lot of time to read all that stuff. But uh, you can assume, for the most part, that they are, uh, that data is getting analyzed by someone, uh, maybe de-identified and encrypted. Uh, but what you'd like is to own it and not sit on their servers, ideally. We haven't made that move yet. So it is a matter that I'm not happy about. My biggest concern is about the future of medicine is about privacy and security. Because I want my data and no one else, and if I want to share it, fine. If I want to sell it, fine, which is your data is worth a lot. So um, this is a problem, but you have to look at each app. The ones I've mentioned, for the most part, they're looking at that data, analyzing it, but not uh, with identification. We have a couple of minutes left, yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, because it's all, it's not, a lot of this is not sitting on your, in your phone, it's cloud-based, so yes, it will hold all this stuff. And another question also technological, is the watches. Yeah. How many watches do you usually wear? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> you, you, you brought up a good point. So she's asking about watches. How many different watches? A blood pressure watch, a glucose watch, a heart cardiogram watch? Yes. That's the problem we have today, is we got all these different companies doing different things, you see? We don't have anybody that's bringing it all together. That's part of the future. So there will be a watch that is the medicalized watch and the, and the phone that does all this stuff. But right now, if you want to have a smartphone ultrasound, you got to have an Android phone. Then you got to have an, I have one of each because I got to have all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What's the view of the insurance company to control this whole process? Yeah, well, they're the bad guys, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody love their insurance company here? Yeah. No. Um, yeah, deny, deny, deny. That's their, their motto. Um, 
they don't really actively slow this down. In the, in the end run here, they're going to have to be part of the solution because this, you, you know, everybody talks about health care in this country and they say the costs are unsustainable, and that is so true. And the insurers, 70% of people are, are covered by their employer, right, in this country. They have to be part of the solution. All these employers basically hire, whether it's United or Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield, to take care of their employees. They have to be uh, working on cutting the cost of care. It isn't just denying things. It's incorporating these things that are free that are very inexpensive. Moore's Law, while medicine was going in one direction to the $3.5 trillion, Moore's Law was taking chips down into uh, you know, uh, exponentially low cost. And we're not using that in medicine. We need to do that. So we have 40 seconds left before they <laughs> take turn off the mic. Yes. Yeah, I know Ura Ring. It's and out of Finland. It's a yeah, great ring. Great, yeah. Great products. And then out of Scandinavia, there's a startup called Habit that is actually doing, they have a 70 plus and 70 flower plus drug built up that gives you your DNA as well as a chip to get the DNA. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think the data on Habit is so good, but the Ura Ring is good. The Ura Ring, I agree with you. Yeah. But I think that I, my point is there are companies. Um, the, the, Uh, yeah, my my thought is where this is headed is that eventually, uh, you know, if Amazon isn't the main coordinator, you will have a voice. By the way, vo the reason why so many people here are big on voice, uh, without you telling me, I think I know, is that it's natural, it's quick, you don't have to type anything, you don't have to go through apps, you're just functional. And so what's going to happen, I think, to your question is all these things will go through a voice platform. And you know, today or this week, uh, Apple's putting out their voice, and obviously you've got Google, and they're all going to compete. But eventually, this will come together through one platform. And it will have diet. It will have sleep. It will have your diabetes, if you have that, your blood pressure, your cardiogram, everything. So yes, that's where it will go. Yes. 